Dennis Bryan, author of Einstein A Life. Why did you devote a chapter to Einstein's brain? Uh, it was such shocking news when I found out that somebody had got his brain. And um, it was exactly what he didn't want to happen. Uh, he told everyone that he didn't want any physical part of him to remain. He didn't want any memorials made to him. He didn't want his home made into a memorial. So that when I heard somebody had his brain and they were slicing it up to find out clues to his genius, I thought, this is perhaps the worst thing that could have ever happened to this man. Where is his brain? It, it's, it, several scientists have it. Um, the man who took the brain has most of it, and the Japanese scientist has some, and there's a, a doctor in Philadelphia has other parts of it. And the conclusion is that it's absolutely ridiculous to search for, for genius in a brain, and that all they can say about it is it's remarkably healthy for a man his age. Who took the brain or originally, and where is most of it now stored? The man who did the autopsy took most of the brain, and it's in Kansas, it's in bottles, and um, it's still in a very healthy state and still can be examined. How did he get it originally? He was doing the autopsy, and he purportedly asked uh, Hans Albert, Einstein's son, if he could have the brain for medical reasons, for research, and he was given permission as long as there was no publicity about it. And immediately there was publicity in the New York Times saying the brain was available. And the man was at Princeton at the time, and he stored it in his basement. And when he divorced his wife, he left the brain for a time with his wife, who was very angry about it, saying things like, I wish they'd get this damn thing out of here. Thomas Harvey was his name in his, of Wichita, Kansas. That's right. And did you talk to him? I did several times. He's now working part-time in a plastic factory. He failed his medical exams when he took them again, so he can't act as a doctor. And he says that he may give this brain to the Hebrew University if they ask for it. And you also found that someone has his eyes. That was even more extraordinary. The man who had been his eye doctor in Princeton uh, somehow appeared at the autopsy, asked permission if he could take the eyes, and was given permission, and has stored them in a bank vault ever since. And uh, he, he says he's done it for his veneration for Einstein, not for any scientific purposes. And where are they stored? What city? They're in somewhere in, in New Jersey in a bank vault. Who was Albert Einstein? He was an extraordinary young man who had a tremendously hard life as a young man. Uh, in college, or, uh, uh, when he finished college, he almost starved because he couldn't get a job. He had uh, antagonized his professors at the uh, Zurich Polytechnic, and he was the only one of his colleagues who didn't get a job directly at that college. And the problem was he didn't know how to handle authority. He treated the professors in the same pleasant, easygoing way that he treated the cleaning women. And the professors in those days in Germany expected to be treated like minor royalty. And, uh, they said he knew it all, he wouldn't listen to them, and uh, he missed all the lectures that didn't interest him, such as math, and uh, the math professor said he was a lazy dog, was his summing up of Einstein. But to his friends, he was an uh, intriguing, dynamic, spontaneous, and to one, uh, a man called Marcel Grossman, who knew him at college only in these early days, Grossman went home to his parents and said, I've met a man who one day is going to be a very great man, which was an incredible prophecy when everybody else was saying, he's a lazy dog, he's not going to make it. What have you done in your life as a profession? Let's think now. Uh, at 16, a World War II broke out. I had just graduated from Bromley Grammar School. Uh, Bromley, incidentally, was where H.G. Wells spent his boyhood. In Great Britain. In Great Britain. And um, for two years, I worked in Fleet Street as a reporter on the Irish News Service. Uh, we were reporting news of Irish people in Britain and Irish people, what they were doing in, in Ireland for British papers. Uh, I was really waiting to join the Royal Air Force. You couldn't do that till you were 18. I took a short course at Southampton University to join the Royal Air Force, became a bomber pilot. Uh, after the war, I did freelance writing. I wrote some plays. Uh, they were done in what you would call repertory companies and uh, off-Broadway, the equivalent. 
And I emigrated to America in 1957, two years after Einstein had died. And what have you done since you've been in the States? I started by doing freelance writing. I worked for Scholastic Magazines as an editor. I worked with a, uh, a literary agency called Writers Literary Agency. And in the early 60s, I started writing. I wrote The Science of Crime Detection for Doubleday. I then wrote a novel called The Love Minded, which got very good quotes from people like P.G. Woodhouse and Evan Thomas, quite different sort of writers. And always I've been intrigued with biography. When I was um, uh, 17 in Fleet Street, I wrote an article about Lawrence of Arabia. Now, uh, he was uh, the cliché, a legend in his own time. And that's what's always appealed to me, to find the truth about the so-called legends in their own time. I wanted to say, what I think scientists and biographers have in common is the search for mysteries, to try to solve mysteries. Where do you live today? Uh, I live in West Palm Beach, Florida. How long have you lived there? About 20 years. Are you an American citizen? No. Kept no. your British passport? Kept my British passport. I have an American wife who helped me tremendously on the book, an American daughter, and an American grandson and an American granddaughter. When was the first time you thought you would be interested in doing a biography on Albert Einstein? 1972. I telephoned his secretary, Helen Dukas, about something entirely differently. And she began to talk about a seance that Einstein had attended in California in 1931 with his friend Upton Sinclair, who was very interested in psychic phenomena. And at this seance, she was scared out of her which she was sitting in an adjoining room where the seance was taking place and there was suddenly a ring at the door and she thought it was a spirit appearing it was actually somebody with a, a, a letter and uh, nothing had happened at the seance and the people organizing it including Upton Sinclair gave the usual answer there are unfriendly spirits in the circle and one of the unfriendliest would have been Einstein who was a complete rationalist and said, even if I saw a ghost, I wouldn't believe it. But strangely enough, he believed that uh, telepathy might be possible. You have a number of pictures in the book, and I want to try to show this small one right here, because Helen Dukas is in that picture. Can you tell us where she is in there? Uh, she's on my left, where your finger's right touching her. She's, she, that's right. That's next to her is Einstein's stepdaughter, Margot. There's unmistakably Einstein in what we British call braces. There's his very good friend next to him, uh, Dr. Bucky, Dr. Bucky's wife. And behind, the tallest man behind Margot is Thomas Bucky, who was also a very close friend and gave me a great deal of information about Einstein, personal information. Knew him very well. Is Helen Dukas still alive? No, she died in 18, 1986. What role did she play in Einstein's life? She became his secretary in 1928. She was scared out of her wits when it was suggested she should be his secretary because, like me, she knew nothing about physics. But she was persuaded to go and see him, and he was very ill at the time. He was in bed. He'd had a very badly strained heart, and she was taken up by his wife, and uh, the wife then, his second wife, Elsa, who was also his cousin. And Einstein immediately put her completely at ease with a few soft jokes. What was she like? Very pleasant, very easy to talk with, but absolutely tough in defending him, a real watchdog. She scared people off, who try, strangers who tried to see him and badger him. And uh, she devoted her life absolutely to him. A secretary and after his wife, uh, Elsa died in 1936. She was the housekeeper. I think I read in your book that you said that on eight occasions over 11 years, he was nominated for a Nobel Prize. Why did it take so long for him to get one? Fascinating. Um, one, the judges didn't understand relativity. It had not been experimentally proved until after World War I, when Eddington did an experiment proving it to be accurate. And also, there was a definite anti-Semitic tinge in the uh, people who uh, voted for him. Uh, one man was a very close friend of Hermann Goering's, and his being Jewish and very pro-Jewish uh, was the cause. So it was a mixture of they didn't understand relativity. And it, in fact, when they gave him the prize in 1922, it was for the photoelectric effect, another of his discoveries, which um, 
Today we make use of it in automatically opening doors, the electric eye we call it. 